。喂，测试测试，请问听得到吗？如果逸轩你现在在听的话，麻烦呃看能不能在聊天室留一段讯息让我看一下。好的一轩杂音会很重吗？这边Hi. So I see there are three people here. I think including our TA.、Uh, there are three people. So、uh, the other two people, can you、um, say something on the chat room so that、uh, I know who you are? And、uh, yeah, that's all, I guess. <laughs> 
so here we still have three people. Um, but I think, uh, can you guys find the chat room? I only can see myself in the chatting screen as the participant in the chat room. But since our TA said something earlier in the chat room, I think everybody can freely join the chat. Okay, just one minute until we start the class. Okay, so it's uh, one o'clock now, although we only have actually two people online, but I will still uh, start the class and also make the VOD later so that everybody can watch it later. Okay, so this week we're going to start with a new chapter called the um, Introduction to Probability. So actually, if you have studied something like statistics or even high school math in Taiwan before, then you might have heard uh, most of the content here. But I'm going to uh, introduce this in a little bit different way than other courses that you have maybe um, got before. Okay, so um, either way, I think it could be at least a summary of what you have learned before. So first of all, uh, let's de uh, define something called events. Okay, so a simple event is an individual outcome in the sample space, okay? And uh, an event is a collection of set of one or more simple event in a sample space. So basically, simple event could be something, uh, just one occurrence, but event is a more broadly defined. E so any simple event is a, an event, but event might not be a simple event. Okay, so the example here gives it a very clear idea. So for example, if you roll a die, then your whole space, which uh, usually denoted as S, is 1 to 6. And a simple event is something like the outcome 3. Okay, there's only 6 different outcomes that could come out from rolling a die. And the event could be something more complicated, such as the outcome is an even number, or the outcome is a low number. Okay, so even number means 2, 4, 6. Low number means something like 1, 2, 3. Okay, so that means uh, it's, it's more broadly defined. And uh, um, then for this event, we're going to assign some probability onto each of these uh, events. So given a sample space S that has uh, lots of outcome O1, O2, and so on, the probability we assign to this event uh, must satisfy some requirement. So we cannot say a, uh, especially a probability function p, okay, here the probability function you know by p, this p has some basic restriction or uh, axiom that it has to be, has to satisfy, okay? So the first one, um, the first one is, is very simple, that, you know, all the probability events must be non-negative, meaning that, you know, none of, none of the event can, um, none of the event can have the chance of happening that's lower than zero, okay? Uh, the lowest possible number is zero. And on the other hand, the probability of the entire sample space must be one, 
meaning that if you define a sample space, say rolling a die, then uh, you know the either one or two or you know three, four, five, six has to happen. There is nothing like rolling a die and you get a seven. So uh, you know the collection of the order probability from one to six must uh, be summed up to one. That's the PS uh, probability of the whole sample space. This this is the sample space. Okay, uh, has to be one. And the third one is a uh, it's called the um, addition rule. Okay, so for two disjoint events A and B, and we will actually define what is disjoint event later. But the idea, if you have heard something called the Venn diagram, then disjoint means something like this. It means that these two outcomes are not uh, so either A happen. If or I should say, if e, if event A happen, then B won't happen, for sure. And if B event B happen, then event A won't happen. The counter example is something like this, where it has some overlap. Then in this region, um, basically A intersection with B is not non-empty. Okay, it's not empty set. So it means that there's something here. That means if so we cannot say if A happens, B won't happen for sure. Because if it happens you know, inside here, then um, A and B both happen. Mm -hmm. So if a this if events A and B are disjoint, then we have this uh, union rule or addition rule that probability of A or B happen will equal to P of A happen and plus P of uh, B happen. And that's the basic restriction to probability. But we actually have three different approaches to different uh, probability functions. There are different a way of thinking about probability. The classical approach is the most common uh, seen one. You probably learned it at first uh, in a mass course, maybe in high school or even earlier. And at least in, in like, uh, university level, uh, undergrad level uh, probability or uh, statistic course, you will, you should have learned it before. So, okay, so I see now there's uh, five people joining us. I'm very happy to see you. So if you can actually find a chat room, please uh, type something in the chat room, especially your names so that I know who you are. Okay, so if so the first one, the classical approach, if an experiment has n sample outcome, this method will simply assign a probability of 1 over n to each of these events. In other words, basically we assume that if there's n different cases, each of them has the same probability uh, of happening. And the simple example is roll, roll a die. If you roll a die 1 to 6, each simple event, you know, each simple event is like 1, 2, three, so, and so on. Uh, each of these must have a probability of one six. Okay. Um, and the second approach, uh, uh, sorry, the second example is row two row a die. Okay, so you roll two dice, basically. If you roll two dice, then there are many, many different cases now. Actually, uh, there are Six times six equals uh, sixty. Uh, th sorry, thirty-six cases now, and because each of these event will still have uh, the same probability, so each of the event will have a one over uh, thirty-six chance of occurring. Now, for the approaches to probability, the second approaches to probability is the relative uh, frequency approach. In this one. Um, the idea is that if we can run an experiment for many, many, many times, the same experiment for many, many times, and then uh, if a, a event A occur with ti n time, a totally occur for n of A times, then um, the relative frequency, if you wrote the die n, uh, n times, or you know, let the, this experiment run for n times, then the probability will be assigned as n over n of a n over uh, n a over n. In this method, we attempt to define the p a 
would be a limit of this uh, probability, uh, this ratio. Okay, so it's like the example here is very simple. So if you again roll a die, okay, this is roll a die, and you roll it for a hundred times, okay, and suppose. So this is actually random. So you actually don't know how many times. You cannot for, say for sure how many times uh, one, the number one will be the result, the outcome. Okay, so but suppose it happens for 15 times. Then we define the probability of PA as 15 over 100. That's around uh, point, uh, that's exactly point uh, 15. So if you increase this, this is the, n okay and this is the n a so if you increase this n to infinity so this will also goes up very large uh, very large then this number will actually approach something very close to one six and that's why this approach also can be used to define probability and the second example would be something um, but this, so the computer store tracks the daily sale of desktop computers in the past 30 days. And the resulting data is the following. Uh, so desktop sold uh, for zero, it happens for one day. So if there's two days that the desktop sold for, two, so for one, and there's like 12 days that, you know, 12 days that this laptop, uh, desktop has sold for three, okay? so. What is, what is the probability that this store will sell three desktops on any given day? What would be the probability? If you're online, uh, I will give you uh, 30 seconds to type, the, re type the, the answer you think. If no one typed the uh, answer in 30 seconds, I will tell you the answer. Okay, I think no one wants to answer my question. So here you can see that the total number of days that this experiment has happened, there's uh, 30 days, right? It's wrote here. So this, the sum of this equal to 30. And among these 30 days, uh, the, there's 12 days. There are 12 days that the, laptop, uh, the desktop sold for num uh, three. Okay, so 12 over 30 would be our answer. And so this is equal to um, six, 15, so this is five of them, that's uh, actually 0.4. So this is 40% chance that the store will sell three decks of any, any given day, okay? And the last approach is the uh, most maybe counterintuitive or at least uh, not very straightforward one, is the subjective approach. In the subjective approach, we basically define the probability as the degree of belief. Okay, so the key words here is belief. Okay, so the belief that we hold in the occurrence of the event. Thus, the so the judgment is based on based as the basis for uh, assigning probability. So the key words here is also judgment. A uh, judgment, yeah. So since it's, it is a judgment, it means that it's actually very subjective. Okay, so it's not something very objective as uh, what we defined before. Before, in the two, the other two approach, some people might have a uh, different approach. Okay, but notice that the classic approach also has some sort of judgment because that's how we judge the uh, occurrence of an event. It's actually uh, a, a underlying or hidden assumption there. Okay? Um, okay, so... When do we need this judgment? Basically, we, if we can run the experiment for many, many times, the same experiment for many, many times, to try out the probability, then we can simply use the, uh, the previous approach, the uh, relatively, uh, relative frequency approach. Here, it's, it is exactly because we have the, 
limit to experiment so that we cannot really uh, re repeat the experiment. And that's why we need this uh, subjective approach. The example here, for example, uh, the first example, you consider a horse race with eight different horses running. So what is the probability for a particular horse to win? So do you think it is reasonable to assume that the probability is one eighth? Okay, note that here we, we cannot run the same horse race. The same horse race means exactly the same hor eight horses and the exact same timing. So if, even if you gather the, the same eight horses and run the race again, you cannot really, um, you cannot really, uh, you know, repeat the same experiment because it's a different condition. Okay, so here we cannot apply the relative frequency approach, and that's the reason. Okay, I'm gonna check with the TA to see whether we can actually everybody can actually hear me, and uh, you know, the class is going through uh, smoothly because I now I only see one people left. Uh, in the audience, I, I'm worried that people are not uh, receiving the correct signal. Okay, so I'm waiting for the TA to let me know whether you guys can uh, perfectly hear me. Um, or if the TA, if our TA can hear me now, uh, please also still type something into the chat room to make sure that the chat room is working and I can, you know, hear you guys clearly. Oh, uh, sorry, you guys can hear me clearly, sorry. Or if you guys cannot use the chat room, you guys know my email, right? Okay, okay. The the TA told me that it's actually normal, so I will just continue. Okay. So, um, as you see, uh, the reason why we use a horse race example here is you know that horse race is a common gambling setting, right? So, uh, the reason why we can actually have this gambling is exactly because different people use a different subjective approach to the probability. If everybody believes the same horse will win the, uh, will win the race with the highest probability, for example, we, everybody think that maybe uh, Red Heart, a, a, a horse named Red Heart, will win the race. Everybody think that this horse will win the race. Then everybody will bet on this horse, and no one can benefit from this bet. Then there's no such thing as a gambling market that could form. Okay, so exactly we are having different judgment is what makes the betting possible, okay? And the second example is that um, what is the probability for a particular stock to go up tomorrow? Okay, so you might have noticed that recently the U.S. stock market or actually all, all over the world, different stock market having a very, uh, very big shock due to the... Uh, uh, coronavirus situation and so but can you say for sure what's the probability that the uh, even not even the particular stock but uh, what what's the what's the uh, what what's the probability that the Nasdaq uh, or Dow Jones will go up or down or stay the same you know there's three chances so, so there's three different cases what's the probability so you you know, what's, you, you really also cannot, you also cannot repeat this experiment, right? Because tomorrow or tonight, when the Dow Jones are up or Nasdaq are up, it only happened once. You can't really repeat the uh, experiment. So we cannot, we cannot use the relative frequency approach. Okay. And, um, and notice that here, uh, unlike the horse racing example where there's maybe too many randomness. Uh, maybe the, the stock market, you may think you have some underlying principle there. So if you use a sophisticated model uh, that relies on past data, okay, for example, if you uh, learn some investment theory before, then you might heard of the 
word, uh, the, the coefficient beta. And this, uh, so this beta can be a very good uh, indication of the uh, quality or the, the uh, property of a particular stock. Okay, so the, the so if you use such a model, then you can make uh, a better prediction of what's the probability of this uh, this uh, stock goes up or down. Okay, and this is m might be um, better than blindly following a EO founded judgment. Okay, that's which is also uh, often dangerous. Okay, so after these three approaches to pr uh, probability. Um, uh, let's define something called the complementary events. So uh, this is just simply the opposite of an event. Okay, so let A be an event, the complement of A, sometimes denote as A with a C here, or in bar A, actually looks more like this, bar A, then the probability of bar A or A complement the same thing, this is the same thing, uh, simply equals to 1 minus PA, or you can write this as PS minus PA. Okay, so graphically, this is, suppose this is S, this is A, then the rest is A complement. Okay, so example is, if you roll a die, and the event you define A, this is A here, A is uh, 3, then the probability is 1, 6, right? And the probability of the outcome that is not three, not a three, then is simply one minus one over six, which is five over six. And now, um, we now we talk about the union and addition. So let A and B be two events. Then, generally speaking, P probability of A union B will be P A plus P B minus P. Uh, intersection with B. That's, we actually talked about this already. Basically, you can see this general Venn diagram. This is A, this is B, then this is A intersection B, right? So, and this whole thing, this whole thing P is A union B. So, the, the total is probability of A, probability of B, but you double count this A intersection B part. So you, you subtract from that part. So you get this formula. Okay, and recall that we already said that, but if A and B are mutually exclusive, then P, union, uh, P of A union B will be PA plus PB. So basically this one would be zero. So that means P, a is zero, and that's exactly uh, the definition of uh, mutually exclusive. Okay, so example here, if you roll a die, probability of even will be uh, a, a half, and probability, this is half, right? This is half, this is also half. Probability of low is half, but the probability of even and the low, basically, uh, even and low, basically one, two, three, but even number, the two is the only number. So that's one, uh, six. Actually, but you can actually count, calculate this, right? So probability of P even low, you can say that's probability of even plus probability of uh, low minus probability, uh, sorry, sorry. This is not, okay. This is simply that I already uh, said, I, I, I jumped to the second one. So I was talking about this one. So if you want to know probability of even or low, then you do probability of even, probability of low, minus probability of even and low. And that gives you five over six. Okay. And for example, another case is if you probability of one or six, so if you roll a die, one or six are disjoint or mutually exclusive event, right? If one happened, six cannot happen. If six happened, one cannot happen. So uh, you simply add these two together and the minus is actually doesn't really matter. And that gives you two over six, which is one third. Okay.
And now, uh, this is also a very important definition, which is the marginal probability. Here we have a worker example. This marginal probability is defined when there is two-dimensional data. Here, the two dimensions are whether you expose to chemical. So let's say this is this variable is called expose. It's equal to one if you expose, equal to zero if you're not exposed. This is number of worker who, uh, sorry, this is whether you have constructed, uh, contracted cancer, okay? So uh, contracted cancer, so we say this is cancer. So you either, is, this is equal to one if you have cancer, equal to zero if you don't have cancer. So this is one, this is zero, this is one, this is zero. And this 220, that means there are 220 people who both uh, the expose equals to zero and the cancer equal to uh, uh, sorry, can exposed equal to one and cancer equal to one. There, oh, there are 2,200 people like this. Okay, and what's the marginal probability? The idea is actually quite simple. The marginal probability is I, if I, when there are actually two dimension data, right? There's the first dimension and the second dimension, but I only want to know the probability that uh, sorry, uh, that probability of all workers that have contracted cancer. What's that? So this is actually quite simple, right? If you look at this table, it will be this one, this one, because you don't care whether this person exposed to chemical or not. You just want to know the total number of people who are contracted by cancer. So you simply do a calculation this way, and you get the summation of 280, 268. So the probability of worker who have contract contract cancer will be two eighty at uh, two sixty eight over one thousand. That's uh, point two two sixty eight. And if you want the probability of exposed to chemical, you go this way. You get the this is another marginal probability. Or you go this way, you get another marginal probability. If you go this way, you get another pro marginal probability. And note that the sum of these two must equal to one thousand, or this total sum. And th the sum of these two is also equal to 1,000, okay? Because you either, uh, you, you could either have cancer or not, or it's either way, okay? And you either expose to chemical or not, okay? So this, uh, uh, this is how you look at a joint probability uh, table and how you define marginal probabilities. Now we're gonna talk about a important idea or actually more difficult one that's called the conditional probability. Um, by the way, uh, I still see not that many people online now. Is it because you guys cannot use the uh, cannot use the chat room so you guys uh, don't want to listen to the lecture right away? If that's the case, you can write me a email if you cannot use the chat room, write me an email asking about questions or tell me why you couldn't join the chat room. Um, I can still look at the email now and I will uh, try to help you, okay? So conditional probability. So what is conditional probability? The idea of conditional probability is like this. So we want to know the probability of, uh, of A still the event A, given that B has already occurred or B already happened. Okay, so B has occurred. We already know that the coronavirus has happened. What, what is the probability of Taiwan uh, become a, a so the, the, the number of people in Taiwan got affected more than a thousand people? What's the chance of that happening? So we need to know both probability A and probability B to actually uh, know that, right? So, uh, but if the coronavirus hasn't happened, then we know this chance is very low. 
but after coronavirus has happened, this trend is being higher. So probability of A conditional on B would, you know, depends on B. And the exact formula is like this. So uh, a Venn diagram would actually also help a lot here. So say this is A, this is B, and this is A intersect with B. So now the idea that is, the idea is, um, so we already know that B happened, right? What's the, what is the probability that A happened? Because B happened, but we want to know still when A will happen. So that's the relative ratio of this area, right, to this yellow area. And so that is exactly probability of A intersect with B over PB. This yellow area has already occurred. We want to know what's the probability that A also occur. Okay, so the, the keywords here is also. So that's intersection. Okay, so P intersect with B over P, B. That's the answer. Okay, and if A and B are independent, what is independent? Then we define dependent as the following. So if A and B are independent, we say that uh, basically P, A times uh, P intersect with B would be P, A times P, B. Okay, this is a very important idea. That's, this is the, oh, sorry. Uh, this is the definition of independent. Okay, so if you want to check whether two events are independent or not, this is the only condition that you need to check. You need to check whether you need to calculate this first and then calculate this, calculate this, and see whether this equals to this times that. Okay, so if that happens, so then based on given our formula, P A condition on B is P A intersect with B over P B, and this equals to P A times P B, uh, P A and P A times P B. Uh, if A, B are independent, then P, B, and P, B will cross out, gives us P, A. Okay, that gives us this condition. And this is actually quite intuitive, because if A and B are independent, what that means is whether A happened doesn't depend on whether B happened. The B's condition, whether that happened, doesn't affect uh, condition A. And if that's true, then it means if you ask the question of P A conditional on B, since the whether B happened doesn't really matter, right? So you just cross out B. So you know, so that gives you P of A. Okay? And what if P you know what if A and B are mutually ex exclusive? This is even simpler, right? Because if it is mutually exclusive this will equal to zero. P A intersections B will equal to zero. And since this is zero, then the whole thing will be zero. So P A condition on B, B condition on A will be zero. So we're using the Venn diagram, this is clear. So if A happen, conditional on A happen, we know that B will never happen. Conditional on B happen, we know that A will never happen. So either way, it is zero. Okay, so from the same table that we uh, looked at before, the number of worker example, how do we define the conditional probability? This is actually uh, also quite simple. We want to know, for example, given that someone has exposed to chemical, okay, given that someone has exposed to chemical, what is the probability that this worker has cancer? So. Given that you exposed to chemical, who is ex who are exposed to chemical? These people are exposed to chemical. Out of these three hundred and fifty five people, how many have the cancer? Uh, that's two hundred and twenty, right? So you you do two hundred and twenty uh, over three hundred and fifty five. That gives you uh, around 
around 0.6, okay? Uh, is it exactly 0.6? Let me double check. Uh, so not, not really. So this is equal to 0.6197, okay? So it's uh, actually around 0.62, okay? Now, given the uh, given our definition of uh, given our definition of uh, conditional probability, there's a uh, implied rule here called the multiplication rule. It's used to um, actually this rule is used to to calculate the joint probability of two events. So it is simple. Uh, rearrangement of the conditional probability formula. Um, okay, so remember that, uh, sorry. Remember that PA conditional on B equals to PA intersect with B over PB, right? So if you put this denominator here, then you got this. Okay, so P A condition on B times P B will be P intersect with B. Or the other way around will gives you, so if you can also say P B condition on A is, is equal to P A, con A intersect with B. Because P B intersect with A and A intersect with B is the same. And over P A now. So if you move this here, then you've got this, this one. So Again, P over uh, P A intersect with B will be equal to Z. Also, notice that since this is this, so these two also equal to each other. Right? This is a very useful rule. Okay, so uh, uh, let's give an example. Maybe it will be clear. Okay, so here, suppose well, we want to calculate the probability of you uh, drawing a spade, ace, and uh, uh, the event A is an ace. The event B, uh, the, sorry, the event A is an ace. The event B is a spade. So, um, sorry, this is actually a typo. So this is not uh, union, but intersection. Okay. So A intersect with B. That's the spade ace. What's, what is the, so you know that, so you already know that probability of B, that's the spade. Uh, spade consists of one fourth of the total deck, right? And what is the condition on this? This is a spade. What's the probability of you drawing ace? Because ace happened one over 13. There's A to K. There are 13 cards. So use the condition, uh, classical approach probability you know that's oh, 1 over 13. Then when you calculate this, uh, that's P, uh, this is an, again a typo, sorry. A intersect with B will be P intersect, uh, P of A condition on B times PB. Okay, that's the, use the multiplication rule. Okay, uh, I, will, I will fix this typo for the slide uh, later, uh, later today or tomorrow and upload the new version. Okay, so and the multiplication rule also gives us something called the probability tree, which will be important in our future chapter. Okay, so uh, this is a, a voting example. Okay, so um, suppose uh, the future of the the you know, the future of, of the outcome of the election, there is going to be two variable that define the outcome of this uh, election. So whether the either socialist will win or the conservative will win. And after that, there's two events will happen. Either the asset will be na uh, nationalized or the asset will not be nationalized. Uh, this, this here is, there's also two cases. So given that socialist win, the probability the probability that the asset will be nationalized is point A, so the other way is point. So this is this is actually 
probability of socialist wing, and then nationalize or non-nationalize. Okay, these are the two. So this is a conditional probability, and this is the probability of socialist wing. So we want to know. So we, if we want to know the probability of the probability of socialist wing, ah,、uh, sorry, the probability of socialist wing and the、uh, asset being being nationalized, we simply give a product of point six and the、uh, point eight. That gives you point、uh, six times point eight. That equals to point. Oh, sorry, the calculation is already here. Okay, so.、Uh, So that's the probability of both happening. So similarly, similarly, if you want to know the probability of the socialist wing and the asset being not nationalized, that's gonna be point six times point two, which equals to point one two. Okay, and this the other way, the conservative wing. Has a probability of point four, and the probability that in that case, conditional on that, the asset will be nationalized is point three. So you do a multiplication of point four point point times point three, that gives you point one、uh, two as well. And the last case is point four times point seven,、uh, which is point twenty eight. Okay, and. Uh, that's the probability of some、uh, conservative wing and the asset being nationalized. And suppose now the question you want to actually know, you know, you don't care whether socialist wing or the conservative wing. You only care that, you know, whether your asset will be nationalized. So how do you do that? So the event that your asset being being nationalized is actually here and here, right? So you care about only the event, the probability here and the probability here. So you add these two together. Point forty-eight plus point one two equals to point six. So you now you know the probability of、um, your asset being nationalized is point six. Okay.、Uh, let me. Okay. So, let me give you not now another example. Okay, so、uh, suppose a hospital is testing patient for a certain disease, disease. So now like a coronavirus. If a patient has the disease, the test is designed to return a positive result. So positive means, you know, has disease. Okay. And if a patient does not have the disease,、um, sorry, this is too ugly. Has okay, and if the patient does not have the disease, the test will be、uh, a, a negative, so positive, negative. Okay, so no test is perfect though. Okay, so we know that also the coronavirus test is not perfect. Oh,、uh, so. Suppose it is not perfect in the following way. So ninety nine percent of the patient、uh, who have the disease will be test positive. So if you actually have the disease, then the ninety nine percent of the chance it will tell you that it's positive. And another thing is that so it seems pretty good, right? So ninety nine percent of the chance this is somewhat accurate. If you have the disease, it will tell you that you have the disease. By the way, the coronavirus one. This one is actually around only around sixty. Okay, so it's a quite different scenario. And and the second way that this is not perfect is that five percent of the patient who don't have the disease will also test positive. So if you don't have the disease, there's still a five percent chance that I will tell you that、uh, you know you have the disease. Okay, and. Uh, oh, the the second the last one is is not that the, this test is not perfect. It's just that, as a matter of fact, ten percent of the population in the question has the disease. Okay.
Um, so now if a random patient tests positive, what is the probability that they have the disease? Okay. Uh, given the above information, please give a guess of the answer. Okay, what is the, your guess? So given someone go get tested and that result is saying that it is positive, what is the probability that they have the disease? We will answer you the question uh, in the next slide. Give a, give a guess. Okay, so uh, thanks waiting for letting us know. So actually, uh, I have announced in the classroom last week that we're going to all switch to e-class. And uh, if you uh, still don't know how to use the e-class, you should simply Google e-class uh, NCU, National Central University, and you should be able to find the, uh, the website. And you can use your portal uh, to log in. And also, I actually send out email to your uh, school email account and notif notify you guys that we will have the class online and what is the, uh, the channel's uh, link. Okay, so uh, it shouldn't be a, a big problem. And, um, okay, so now I think everybody already have the guess. Let's look, uh, looks like the... A power, but like looks like the answer. So, first of all, we know that ten percent of the population actually has disease. So, has disease. That's ten percent of the total population. Uh, let's write point one here. Easier to to see, and who does not have the disease, does not have the disease, that's 0.9. Okay, and if you have the disease, then 99% of the chance, I will, I will say that's positive. And this way I will say you that you're negative. Uh, only 1% chance I will say you're negative. The other way around, if you don't have the disease, I will still have 0.5%, 0.05% saying that it is positive. And only, uh, so 95% of the chance, I will tell you that is negative, which is correct, right? So if you look at the probability of giving you a correct answer, that's actually pretty high. You don't have, you have the disease 99% of the chance, I will tell you that you are positive. If you do have, you don't have the disease 95% chance, I will tell you it is negative. So it seems like this test is already pretty good, but is it really good though? So now we want to know what is the probability that they have the disease given that the test is positive. The there is two ways that the test is positive. One is that you has it and test you positive. The other way is you don't have it, but still test you positive. So the total probability is 0.1 times 0.99 and the 0.9 times uh, 0.05. Okay, and this is 0 0.099 and this is uh, 0 0.045 yes okay and you can see this as two event this is th this is probability that you are positive and has the disease this is the probability that you um, don't have the disease but test it positive. So the red leaflet ratio between these two, this is almost twice as this one. So if you write the total, as in the previous example, 
as in the previous example, we can note that the total chance of someone being tested as positive is 0.099 plus 0.045, right? And what is the actual chance of you being um, has the disease? That's the 0 0.099, right? And so that's the actual answer. So this equals to what? Let me use a calculator to calculate it. So that equals to 0 0.144, 0 0.099, which equals to 68-75%. Okay, so if someone go to the hospital and was given this test and it says that it's positive, the actual chance that uh, this someone actually have the disease is actually lower than 70%. So uh, now Think about the guess you gave here. Is it close to the 68% uh, here? I will say for most people, it's probably not very close. It's, you might have a much higher estimation of the uh, probability. And that's why this kind of a probability tree is very useful. Okay, and so for the rest of uh, for the rest of the first section, I will talk about um, discrete probability distribution uh, and so, so some other uh, some probability distribution case. So the discrete probability distribution is actually the simplest uh, case. So basically, uh, if the event are discrete, for example, you want to know uh, what's the What is the um, probability that the number of different uh, of plants in in service? So, because the number of plants has to be a discrete number, it's gonna be either one or two or three or four or maybe five, but it's not gonna be something one point five or two point five or you know two point four. This cannot happen. So this is called discrete. Okay. So if it, is, if it is discrete, how do you draw a discrete uh, probability distribution? The height of each of these event happen will be this. So this graph, what it means is that there is a 30% chance that the number of plants in service is one, and a 40% chance that it is uh, two, and a 20% chance that it is uh, three, and a 10% chance that it is uh, four. So because the sum of 0.4 is uh, 1 to 4 is actually 1, the sum is equal to 1. So we know that this is the whole event space. So either the number of plants in service is, is from 1 to 4. Another case is the um, continuous probability distribution. Now you are looking at the probability distribution for time to complete a project and the unit is week, weeks. Okay, so for weeks, because time is a continuous variable. So you can say one week, but you can also say 1.5 week. Okay, you can even say square root two weeks. That's 1.4 something weeks. That can be defined because we can define uh, the week as a very small unit of number, say second, one second is, is, you know, a very tiny proportion of a week, right? So a day is one seventh a week, an hour is uh, one over seven times 24 weeks. One hour equals to, you know, this many weeks, okay? So this is a continuous variable. 
and this con this distribution draw here, what it means is that so the height. You cannot say that. You cannot say that, for example, if this is uh, twelve, you cannot say that. Uh, the 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 probability that twelve week happen, would be a probability of say point three here. Okay. The reason why you cannot say that is because, it's very easy to verify because you move a little bit here, a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, the height will be very similar, right? So you have something a little bit over, um, point three, a little bit under point three, and if you go a little bit. Still further, you got the same thing, point two something, point three something, but you add over this, e you easily get something that's greater than one. Okay, so the probability defined here is uh, different from the discrete case. You define, you say that the probability that the time to complete a project is between, is between. Fourteen and eighteen weeks is is between fourteen and eighteen weeks is defined as the area here over the total area, which is one. So if this area is half of the total area, then that you say the probability that the pro, uh, the time to complete a project is uh, fourteen to eighteen weeks is uh, half. Okay. And this is called the probability density function. So the height here, the height here, this height is called density. Okay, and uh, you can convert this PDF probability density function stands for PDF. You can convert PDF to something called CDF. It's a cumulated distribution function. So how do you read this? So basically, the height here is point two. It means that the probability that you know the height, uh, the 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 time to complete project is under consistent. For example, the longest possible is twenty two weeks, as it rose here, twenty two weeks, right? So twenty two weeks, if you the probability that the time to complete the project is under or equal to 22 weeks must be uh, one because there's no uh, there's not no higher possible numbers of weeks right so this is one and it cannot be lower than 10 weeks so the probability that it's gonna be lower or equal to 10 weeks is basically zero okay here notice that basically if you say in a continuous probability event Although you say that this is the density for 18 weeks, but you basically say that the probability of weeks, the time, time to complete weeks is equal to 18, exactly equal to, uh, sorry. <laughs> the weeks equals to 18, exactly equals to 18 is basically zero, okay? So the probability, each probability, each single event, but the, the probability is actually zero. And we only say that is the density, and we only calculate the sum of the area. And if you don't know how to calculate this sum of the area, that's actually fine. You, you should use, you should, you know, notice that it's uh, using an integral. It's that, that's calculus. So if you don't know it, that's fine. Okay, so the CDF basically describes um, the the chance that you know uh, what's the cumulated to that number? What's the chance that it will happen under forty weeks? And how do you convert a PDF to CDF? It's also very simple. So, for example, you see the number fourteen correspond to percent here, okay? Because this area means the chance that you know the time to complete a project is between ten and fourteen weeks. But it couldn't be something, the, the time couldn't be less than 10. So this is also the definition that it's up to 14 weeks. So that's going to be exactly 0.2. And that's why it's 0.2 here. Okay.
Now the last thing, the last thing in this chapter, you might also.、Um, You might also have learned this before.、Uh, this is this is called the、uh, expected value. So, given x is a random variable, so、uh, you might be unfamiliar with the term random variable here. But it basically means、uh, it basically means a random event or something that you know could be.、Uh, so, you can say that、uh, for example. X is、uh, roll a die. So、e、x could equal to one, x could equal to two, x could equal to three, all the way x could equal to six. Okay, so this x variable is not fixed number, but it's a random variable. Okay, so if it is discrete, then we define the expected value to be、uh, this summation of. Probability of event i happen and x i. So for the、um, for the for the、uh, roll a die example, the this is x i. This is p i p i all equal to one six. So one times one six is one six. Two times one six is two six, three times three one six one. You know, all the way. Uh, four six five six six six, and you sum over these number, it gives you six over one two six is six is twenty one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and. You know, twenty one over three, uh, six is uh seven two, so it's three point five. That's the expected value of roll a die. What that means is, if you roll a die, you know, the number that you should expect to happen on average to happen is three point six, uh, three point five. Three point five is not actual number that could happen if you roll a die, right? But If you roll a die, you might get one, you might get two, you might get three. On average, you get something around three point five. And if you roll that infinity, infinitely many many times, then it will be exactly the average will be exactly three point five. And if x is continuous, the definition go from a summation to an integration. Again, this class we don't really require you to understand calculus, so we will not really test you this idea, but. You should know that by you know, by definition, is something like this. Okay, so it's actually very similar. The x i become the x here, the p i become the f of x. Remember, this is density. F of x is density, so it's x times density, and you integrate from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so、uh, the example here. Uh, this is a sales example. The x variable here is the number of sets sold. It's going to be either zero, one, two, three, four, five, and the probability corresponding to it is this. So this is x i, this is p i. So if you want to get the expected value, you simply you know do a lot of this、uh, multiplication. You get something, 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 something. And you sum summation over all this and get the number. That's the expected value. And I'm gonna not do this calculation、uh, here. You should be able to do it、uh, yourself. Okay. Now we will、um, have a break for、uh, maybe ten minutes, and we'll come back and talk about、uh, decision making under uncertainty.